Good morning. Good morning. When I was living at a Japanese temple, uh, one of the things that we did, or was common, that for a while was lessons in Japanese language. And it's the only language that I've actually ever learned anything in. Uh, you know, I can say a couple things in Spanish, and then I step back and hope that nobody tries to talk to me in Spanish. But I learned a few things in Japanese. I even took a college course in Japanese. I had no faculty at all in any way, shape, or form for languages. So it was a struggle. I took two years of Vietnamese. Don't ask me to say anything. I can say thank you, and I can say excuse me, and that's about it. Uh, but also at the temple, uh, for a while, we were learning to do the tea ceremony. And in Japan, there's a number of disciplines or practices uh, or arts, and I don't, whatever you want to call them, I'm not sure what to call them. Uh, they developed, they had a highly developed sense of beauty in gardens. And we also see this in China where the meditation monks went out and established gardens. And they also had a tea ceremony, which they did not have in China. I have a student in Washington that is under the delusion that uh, when he sits and he drinks tea the way he does, he's doing the Chinese tea ceremony. And uh, I didn't really know what he was doing until uh, one time we had a retreat. Everybody came in who's been my students for uh, seven to nine days. And uh, in the morning, he would get up and he'd do this tea ceremony which turned out to be exactly the same way that the Vietnamese monks drink tea, drink tea in the morning. They don't consider it a ceremony. In other words, they don't consider it an art form. This is just the way they drink tea. But he went through all the motions. Well, it's very different than us. You know how we drink tea. We get up, we heat some water, put a tea bag in a cup, fill the cup full of water, wait till the color of the water changes, and then we drink our tea. Now, that's not the way they drink it in Asia. You know, they have tea leaves and they do a little thing. They got to warm the pot up and then they warm the tea cups up and then and they get, and it looks, I guess it looks like a ceremony. It's just the way they do it. They also have flower arranging and uh, they have calligraphy. And one of the, the great writers about Zen Buddhism in Japan made a statement that I repeat all the time, that if you take the Japanese culture and you just scratch below the surface, you find the Zen influence, which is very true. Not to be confused with everybody practices Zen, which is not the case at all. Very few people, almost none in Japan, practice what we call Zen, the meditation. We did a little bit of it to begin the day. They, they don't practice that. They don't practice this so much that when a few guys get together, and it's usually a few lay people, uh, maybe they found a, they find a space where they could go and do a little meditation, and they get together maybe a couple times a month. And uh, if they're lucky, they get the local priest to come in and kind of help them learn to do the meditation. And, and uh, he uses the awakening stick for People get swatted on the shoulders to help them relax and do their meditation and does all of that. And maybe teaches them a few chants. And that's called the Zazen Kai, which basically means a meditation group. And most of the temples, the vast majority of the temples, do not have any regular, regular meditation at all. The monasteries that are training the monks do, but the temples don't. And the lay people don't go to the temple like here. Americans are used to going to the temple every, or going to church uh, every Sunday. And of course, the Jews and the Mormons every Saturday, Seventh-day Adventists every Saturday. And they do that on a regular basis. And that's how they support their community of believers. Buddhism in Asia doesn't do that. Buddhism in Asia, the temple's always open. There's almost always a minister or a monk there. 
and you can go knock on the door, or the door is open and you come in. It's a little different thing. It's very much like the Catholic Church was in the Middle Ages before people started stealing from churches, that the door was always unlocked and you could go in, and if you looked around, you could find someone to talk to. But in a survey of people, they found out that even though Soto Zen is the second largest religious school, sect, denomination, whatever you want to call it in Japan, uh, nobody practices meditation. Now, they go to the temple uh, for holidays. They go there for the Buddha's birthday, big celebration, happy time. They go there for the New Year's, another big celebration all across Asia, all parts of Asia. They go there for Ulambana, which they call Obon, and we call in the Vietnamese tradition Gulan, which is a time to remember our mother. And uh, it also focuses on remembering our ancestors, uh, people that taught us as we were growing up. And uh, they're all positive experiences. A lot of big festival, big festival, lots and lots of food. We just got two weeks ago, we had our Gulan festival. We had 300 people here. We had more food than you could shake a stick at. It was really, really good. And uh, we had a good time. We even had a singer. We only got to sing one song this time. We're going to try to make it so he can do more than that the next time. But D.T. Suzuki, who is who I'm talking about, he talked about Japanese culture and the influence of Zen. A number of things were influenced by Zen. One was uh, the way the samurai, we're all familiar with samurai because we have lots of wonderful movies of them going out and cutting each other's heads off. I had a monk that moved here with me. He loved samurai. I love samurai movies. There's nothing like a good battle where heads go flying everywhere. And, and, uh, and of course, it's all make-believe. But they had an attitude about life that they, they didn't have great attachment to it. And so two schools began in Japan. Both of them came out of China. Both of them came out of China within a few years of each other. One is the Rinzai School, the smaller school in Japan. But the aristocracy really liked it, samurai liked it. And it taught them to deal with death. You know, if you can imagine yourself going out, because you're they're, they're like a knight. If you don't, if you're not familiar with it, in Japan the samurai is very much like the knights of, of England or Germany, and, uh, and they were the the lowest level of the aristocracy, if you will. They could carry a weapon, because in Japan you could not own a sword if you weren't a samurai. In Europe you couldn't own a sword and still can't if you're not royalty. So uh, there's limits, you know. People like to talk about, well, they don't have guns in, in like England, they don't have guns. And uh, they don't, in France and Germany, they don't have guns right now. And so nobody gets killed. Well, that's not true. Did you know it's against the law to have a knife in England? What do, you, what do you think? After everybody couldn't have a gun, then they got a knife. So you can have a little, I watch this thing, you can have a little pen knife like this, but if you have a knife that opens up and the, the policeman feels it's too big, he'll take it away from you. So it used to be and the English would stab each other to death, and then they took their knives away, so now they poison each other. It's, it's a very interesting thing, you know, we think we can change human behavior. Well, anyway, so we had the samurai, they were influenced, their code of ethics and honor was influenced by Zen. But what was really important was they conquered death. And there's a story that comes down to us about a, a peasant who had gone to the local castle, and at one time Japan was divided into all its little uh, city-states, you could call them, or counties. Each one had their own loyalty that ran the thing, and they were very protective of it. 
and they had samurai who were their knights, just like Europe, who would uh, protect their interest. And uh, he was basically a commoner, and uh, he went to try to become the beginning of samurai. And the beginning samurai were the guards at the castle. I, I don't think they were full-fledged. I'm not sure about that. But they carried a pike. And in the movie, Joy, see the samurai, and they have the sword, the famous sword. Okay? But in reality, samurai, they used a bow and arrow all the time from horseback in battle. Uh, they used the pike, which is a long spear with a pointy thing on the end of it. Uh, they used in just about any kind of weapon you can think of. And uh, he went and interviewed with the uh, shogun, the head of the castle, to see if he could become a guard. And uh, it was a dream of his because he was just a farm boy. And, uh, you know, the, the, but he did practice Zen, I will say that for him. He did go to the local temple and he would meditate there and the priest at the temple would taught him to meditate. Uh, and he would go there on a regular basis and meditate. There was nobody else there. He just went by, he'd heard about meditation and everything, maybe the, at one of the festivals they had talked about it. They, they did religion in Asia very different than the way we do it here. You know, like I'm doing right now, giving you a talk every Sunday, and maybe encouraging you, maybe discouraging you, maybe saying something you haven't heard before. And uh, he would go and meditate there, and maybe help the priest a little bit. And so he went to do his interview, and he stood behind the show, a very powerful figure, and he said, Sir, I'd like to uh, join your guard, be trained as a guard, and protect you in the castle. And uh, so the children in the said, Do you know how to use a sword? Oh, no, sir, I do not. I don't know how to use a sword. Well, do you know how to use this? He went through all the weapons they had. No, I don't know how to use any of those weapons. Well, then why do you think that you could be a good guard? And he says, because I will be devoted to your protection and the protection of the castle. And he said it in such a way that children was taken aback. And one of the things was that, you know, to, to go off and, and uh, on a regular basis, and to put your life on the line, it's like our soldiers now in Afghanistan, places like that. Uh, it's scary. It's not a. It's not like in the movies. Oh, we're doing fine. Let's have another beer, and then we'll go out, and we'll get shot at, and some of us will die, and they'll blow up our 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 convoy, and all of this. That's scary stuff. There's a lot of tension. That's why all these young. They're all kids. They're coming back from the war and they've got PTSD because you know they're they're suffering from battle fatigue, whatever you want to call it. And so the shogun wasn't sure. See, usually you were born a samurai, and it was a family honor that you had to go and present yourself to the boss. And here's this kid who lives on a farm. Probably his life is not bad. But he, he dreamed of being a samurai. So he said to him, you can't use any of these weapons, no. What makes you think you would be a good guard? And he said, I, I will be devoted to you. I'm making a lot of noise over here, trying to get t tied up in this cable to the microphone. And uh, the samurai said, you know, I see something in you. I'm not sure what I see in you, but I see something in you. I think that maybe you are a master. Now, they use the term master, again, very much like it was used in Europe. Europe, uh, 100 years ago, and even up until 50 years ago, maybe even now, they have masters. They have master carpenters, you know, they have master musicians. This concept that came out of the guilds, and here we had unions, and they had journeymen and they had masters. He says, I think you're a master. Now, they did not have master farmers. 
they just had farmers, they were peasants. And he says, I think you're a master. And the, and the young man said, no, sir, I'm, I'm not a master of anything. But I would like to be a guard for you in the temple. And uh, the shogun said, you may not know that you're a master, but I think you are. There's something that you've mastered. Tell me about yourself. And the young man said, well, I, I don't know what to say. Well, then why doesn't it scare you to be a guard? Oh, I'm not afraid to die. Ah, he said, you are a master. And so he enlisted the young man into the guard. And the young man made a very good guard because he wasn't afraid to die. How could that be? You know, in the martial arts, and boy, they're all over the place now, aren't they? I looked up some martial arts just out of curiosity. Within the, the realm of the Victor Valley, you know, I guess what we would call a reasonable driving distance, there are over 300 different martial arts studios and dojos. And I thought, wow, how did these guys make a living? You know, there's so many of them. But, you know, in the, in the West, our martial art was boxing. By the way, boxing is a very effective martial art if you really know how to box. You know, you've taken some training. You can really defend yourself with that. There's an allure. I had the allure when I was young. Oh, the, oh judo. Oh, I want to learn judo. I did. Oh, judo. You know, that'd be... So, but it was just something new. There was always an advertisement on the back of a comic book. You know, learn judo, buy this book. Anybody that's ever been in a position of being threatened greatly knows that if you hesitate, you lose. If somebody says to you, okay, if you don't give me all your money, I'm going to punch you in the nose, we'll make it. If you hesitate, you lose. Because you're probably picking yourself up off the ground, right? Because the guy's trying, the guy's trying to scare you. And so, he proves that he's not kidding. He's not kidding. I'm going to hit you in the nose if you don't give me your wallet. But if you react to that, and I'm not telling you how to react, you might react by punching him in the nose. You might react if you study martial arts by stepping back. Some martial arts teach you to always keep enough distance that they can't hit you. There's a lot of ways you can react. But the thing is, you need to react in that moment. And the reason why people don't react is they're afraid. I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, I thought I had the job, but I didn't. Because they didn't step forward when they should have stepped forward. I thought I had the opportunity, but I didn't. Because they were hesitant. To be in that moment is the important thing. There was a man, who wasn't a monk, he was a man and he did flower arranging, but it was heavily influenced by the practice of Zen. And he had a famous garden. Now, I will tell you what they do in Japan for traditionally. If, if you, uh, I'm sorry, he didn't do flower arranging. I misspoke. He did tea ceremony. And in Japan, they, they build this very interesting little building. I want you to reflect on it as you leave today. Well, come have lunch with us because we always have lunch on Sunday. And uh, this is the way the tea room, because I remember I said I was studying the tea ceremony when I lived at the temple. The way they did is there's four walls. It's just a little bitty thing. Nobody lives there. It's just a single room, like these little houses, you know, that they're doing. They've gotten real popular for a while. What are they called? Little Tiny houses? Tiny house? Huh? Tiny, Tiny house. house. Yeah, it wasn't even that. It just it just was one room. And in that in the center of that room there was a hole in the floor where they could have a charcoal brazier so they could heat the tea water. And every wall in that room was made out of a different material. So 
get this in your mind. You go into the tea room and you've been invited to the tea ceremony. They're going to make you a cup of tea. That's the whole thing with the tea ceremony. They use a big cup. They make you a cup of tea and you have to drink it in three drinks and you're done. So this is an experience. You're not going there to sit there and gossip and say, well, I'll have a little more coffee while we're at it here. No, you're going to have tea. But every, every wall in that room is different. One room could be um, plaster. Another wall could be wood. Another wall could be brick. Another wall could be reeds, like bamboo. Every wall was different. So when you went in there, it was like a work of art. And in that room, there was an alcove. And it was about that deep. And in that alcove, the tea master would put a piece of artwork. And the artwork could be a calligraphy. It could be a painting. It could be a piece of pottery that was very beautiful. And the master had a collection of these things that he kept in storage, and he only had one out. So when you walked in the room, the first thing that you saw was this alcove, and you would pause for a moment and become the moment. You would see what was to see, and it was nothing to distract you. Now, going into the room outside, because of their Shinto, which is a religion practice, they, you, would, you would wash your hands and your mouth, become clean. You'd come to the door, and I think about this, Japanese people used to be pretty short. They're not so short anymore, but a long time ago they were very short. And the door was always so low that you had to bend down to get into it. You couldn't just walk through it, you had to bend down. And you came in and you saw this beautiful piece of artwork. And then you went and you sat in front of the tea master. And there could be one, two, three people they'd sit down. And the tea ceremony went this way. The tea master would offer you a little uh, sweet, you know, let's say a piece of chocolate or a ginger candy or something like that. And he would give it to you. And uh, you would consume that while he made your tea. And he'd make each, each cup of tea individually. And because the tea was a powder, it was a very old way of making tea. And he would hand it to you, and then he'd make the next cup of tea. And then he'd make the next cup of tea. Well, this particular tea master had a beautiful garden of marigolds. He had all these flowers, and everybody raved about in the town about how spectacular his garden was. So this man, who was a government official, he petitioned the master. He said, I would like you to make me tea. I have heard that your garden is spectacular, and I would like to come see your garden and have a cup of tea. And so the master replied, yes, of course, please come and you can see my cart. And he went out the day before, and he cut down all of his flowers. So when the government official arrived, there wasn't one single flower left in his garden. He had cut them all to the ground. And this official probably wasn't real happy garden was gone. And so he went and went through the door that he had to bend down. And as he stood up, there was one flower in a small vase in the alcove. One flower contains the universe. One moment contains all time. And the tea master tried to teach him that. And the practice of Zen is only this moment. The last moment's gone. The moment that's coming is in the future. The only things that exist is now.